Hi everyone, how's it going? Uh, today we're going to take a look behind the scenes of JavaScript engines, and specifically we're going to take a look at what that means for JavaScript developers like you and I. Now, I work on the V8 team at Google, and V8 is the JavaScript engine that's used within Google Chrome, but also Node.js and some other projects. So let's just initialize this environment variable right there and update the slides, and there we go, yeah. So disclaimer, I am going to talk about some V8-specific internals, but I guarantee that all the performance advice that we'll draw from this knowledge applies not just to V8 and Chrome, but to all browsers and all JavaScript engines across the board. And I think that's really important. So let's get right into it. JavaScript objects can have arbitrary properties associated with them. The names of these properties can consist of alphanumeric characters or even weird Unicode characters as well. But one specific case that JavaScript engines can choose to optimize for are properties whose names are entirely numeric, more specifically, array indexes. In V8, array indexes are stored separately. They're treated specially. Although in many circumstances, these properties behave just like other uh, properties, V8 chooses to store them separately from non-numeric properties for optimization purposes. Internally, V8 even gives these properties a name. They're called elements. So think of it this way. Objects have properties and values, and arrays have indexes that map to elements. It's just the names that we use in V8. Now, whenever you're running JavaScript code, V8 keeps track of what kind of elements each array contains. This information allows V8 to optimize any operations on the array specifically for this type of element. So for example, when you call reduce or map or for each on an array, V8 can use that information to optimize those calls. Now take this array, for example. What kind of elements does it contain? Well, if you were to ask the type of operator in JavaScript, it would tell you that all these three elements are numbers. At the JavaScript language level, that's all you'll get. JavaScript doesn't distinguish between uh, integers, floats, and doubles. But behind the scenes, in the JavaScript engine itself, we can make this more precise distinction. So the elements kind for this array is packed smy elements. And we'll get to the packed part in a minute, so ignore that for now. For now, focus on the smy part. In V8, smy, is, uh, SMI refers to the particular format that we use to store small integers. That's what it stands for, small integer. Later, adding a floating point number to the same array transitions the elements kinds to a more generic version, packed double elements. Now, adding a string literal to the array changes the elements kind once again. V8 assigns an elements kind to each array. And as we've seen, the elements kind of an array is not set in stone. It can change at runtime. In this case, we transitioned all the way from packed my elements to packed elements. So far, we've seen three distinct elements kinds. There's one for smice, doubles, and regular elements. You can think of this as a pyramid, because the set of numbers that can be represented as a smy is a subset of the numbers that can be represented as a double. And the same thing goes for doubles versus regular elements. But what's important here is that these element kind transitions can only occur in one direction. You go from a very specific one, like the ones at the top, to one that is more general, like the ones at the bottom. It only goes downwards. And once we transition to packed elements, which is for regular elements, we can never transition upwards again. We can never go back up to packed double elements, for example. Now, going back to that array that we had before, the array contains five elements. What happens if we assign a value to the index that is far outside of the array's boundaries? For example, if we assign a value at position nine in the array, well, doing this creates holes in the array. The holes are at positions five until eight. The array is now sparse, or holy, as we call it in V8. So creating holes in the array downgrades the elements kind to its holy variant. In this case, we went from packed elements to holy elements. Now, there are other ways of creating holes. For example, if you use the delete operator on an indexed element, that also creates a hole. Or if you have an array literal and you just forget to assign a value, like for example, if you have two commas and there is no value in between them, that would also create a hole. So why does V8 care so much about whether there's a hole in an array or not? Uh, why does it care so much that it has a separate elements kind for holes? 
Let's find out by taking a look at an example. Just pretend that you're a JavaScript engine for the next couple of minutes, OK? And you're getting the element at index 8. What's the value for the element at index 8? That's the question that we need to answer. But I mean, you can't just give the answer right away. You have to do some work. You have to follow the spec to get the answer. So V8 starts off by doing a bounce check on the array index. Is this index between 0 inclusive and the length of the array exclusive? And in this case, the bounce check succeeds, but we still cannot really answer the question of what the result is. More work is needed. So now we look up the property named 8 on the array itself. But in this case, that property doesn't exist, because all that's there is a hole. So we still cannot answer the question. We have to dig a little deeper. Now, because the property is not present on the array itself, we have to go up the prototype chain until either a value is found or the prototype chain ends. And the first thing we check in the prototype chain is array.prototype, because that's the prototype for any array. And this does, not have a uh, this does not have a property named 8 defined on it. So at this point, we still do not know what the answer is. We have to continue to follow the prototype chain. Now, the next item in the prototype chain is object.prototype, because that's the prototype of array.prototype. And we check if the property 8 exists there, but it doesn't. And in this case, the prototype chain ends after reaching object.prototype, but it could be even longer in case someone extended it. That is a totally valid thing to do in JavaScript. You can muck with built-in prototypes. I would say it's probably a bad practice. Uh, but as a JavaScript engine, you have to support these cases because it can happen in the real world. Now, in this case, because the chain ends, we cannot continue searching for the property, which means we can now finally answer our question. The hole at position 8 in the array is undefined. Yay, finally. Well. From a JavaScript engine's perspective, that's a lot of work that we just did just to get an undefined value, right? Now, if you compare that to a packed array, which is an array that is guaranteed to have no holes in it, it turns out that we don't actually have to do a lot of this work. If the array index is within bounds, then the JavaScript engine can already return the value. No other checks or expensive lookups on the prototype chain are needed at all. Now, if we go back to a holy array, even if we get a property that does exist within a holy array, there's still a bit more work that we have to do. We have to check if the property exists first, because we know there are holes in this array. So V8 checks if the index is within the bounds of the array, and it is. But it still doesn't have enough information to return the result. So we must check if the property actually exists in the array, just in case there is a hole at this position. In this case, a property exists, so we can finally return its value. Now, if the property didn't exist, we would be back in the situation from before, where we'd have to look up the prototype chain, which is very expensive and bad for performance. Now, this is the very best case scenario for a holy array. And it's still one more operation compared to a packed array. And this is why, in general, packed arrays are preferred over holy arrays. Operations on packed arrays can just be optimized in a much more aggressive way than operations on holy arrays. For optimal performance, you should try and avoid creating holes whenever you can. So we looked at this pyramid before with this list of elements kinds. There's smice, doubles, and regular elements. And we knew that we can transition downwards throughout this pyramid. But now we learned that it turns out there's actually two flavors for each of these elements kinds. There's the packed version, and there's a holy version. And not only can we transition downwards, we can also transition from left to right. We can go from packed to holy. So instead of two separate pyramids, it's probably a little bit easier to think of elements kinds as a lattice. And that is, in fact, how V8 implements the system around elements kinds and the transitions between them. More concretely, it looks something like this. So we have our SMI, double, and regular elements. And each of those comes in two flavors. There's the packed and the holy version. Now, these are the most common array element kinds, uh, but V8 distinguishes about 20 different element kinds for other things like typed arrays as well. And you can only transition downwards throughout this lattice. It's kind of like that Pokemon Blue tower puzzle where all the tiles have like an arrow drawn on the floor, and when you step on a tile, you can only move in that direction. The same goes here. You can only follow the arrows throughout the lattice, which means you can never go back up. Once a single floating point number is added to an array, it is marked as double, 
even if it later consists of smiles only. And similarly, once you create a hole in an array, it has marked as holy. Now, in general, more specific element kinds enable more fine-grained optimizations. The further down the element kind is in this lattice, the slower manipulations and operations on that object might be. So for optimal performance, it makes sense to, needlessly, uh, to avoid needlessly transitioning between these element kinds and stick to the most specific element kinds uh, that applies to your use case. Let's look at an example for that. For each unique element kind, V8 can apply specific optimizations when performing operations on the array. Whenever you're using for each, for example, V8 can optimize this call based on this knowledge about the elements kind. We can have one set of for each optimizations specifically for packed my elements, another set of optimizations for packed double elements, and so on. And over time, we can add more and more of these optimizations. So if you look at Chrome 59, for example, this is when we uh, just shipped a new pipeline in V8. We had Ignition, our new interpreter, and Turbofan, our new optimizing compiler. And at the time, we didn't really do anything special with this information for for each. So while we, we knew the elements kinds of these arrays, we didn't specifically optimize any of these elements kinds. But by the time Chrome 61 was released, we had optimized for each in Turbofan for all packed elements kinds. And more recently, in Chrome 64, we added support for the holy elements kinds as well, for, for each specifically. So this is a pattern that you'll see repeated over time. Over time, we will add more and more fine-grained and specific optimizations for different elements kinds for specific array functionality. So you could say the same thing about array.prototype.map, for example. We support all these different elements kinds uh, for map in Chrome 64 as well. Same goes for filter sum, every, reduce, reduce write. And then there's some other array methods, um, like find and find index. And these two are a little bit special. If you look them up in the spec, you'll find that these treat holes in arrays a little bit differently than all of the other array methods, because they turn holes into explicit undefined values, which makes things a little bit complicated for us. And for that reason, um, we haven't yet been able to optimize wholly double elements so far. But like I said before, this is something that we're working on. And over time, you can expect to see more green in these lattices for any given array method. So very soon, it will look like this. Now, let's look at another example. This piece of code creates an array of length 3. But what values does the array contain? It just has three holes in it. So the array is sparse at this point. So it gets the element kind, holy smile, holy smile elements because that's the most specific possibility given the currently available information. Now, let's assign a value to position 0 in the array. Well, wait a minute. That's a string instead of a small integer. So in this case, the elements kind transitions to holy elements. Now, we add a value to position 1 in the array, and the elements kind remains unchanged in this case. And finally, we assign another value to the last position in the array. Now, at this point, all three positions in the array are filled. So the array is packed and no longer sparse. However, we cannot transition to a more specific kind as packed elements, as we've, saw, as we've seen earlier. So unfortunately, the elements kind remains holy elements at this point. Once an array is marked as holy, it is holy forever. I believe that's how sainthood works as well. Now, in this scenario, a better solution is, of course, to use an array literal instead. If you know all the values ahead of time, then why not just add them in an array literal? Uh, but if you don't know all the values ahead of time, you can still use a technique that is similar. You can start off with an empty array or with an array that contains some of the values that you already know, and then you can push more values to it as you dynamically compute them or get them from some external source. That way, you avoid creating holes in the array at any given time and the array will never get marked as holy. This approach ensures that V8 optimizes any future operations on the array to the best of its abilities. Life is easier without holes. JavaScript engines can deal with packed arrays much more efficiently. In general, if you need to perform lots of operations on an array, try and avoid creating holes in it. And similarly, you should avoid reading beyond the length of the array, because there's nothing there anyway. So for example, don't write your loops like this. This loop reads all the elements in the array, and then one more. 
it only stops when it finds an undefined or null element. So this also means that it would only work for arrays that don't contain undefined or null. Now, this kind of pattern is just as bad as hitting a hole. It's a different scenario, but it's very similar. Because in this case, the bounce check that we did before fails. The check to see if the property is present fails. And then we need to look up the prototype changes like before. And as we've learned, that is very expensive. So don't do this. And instead, keep your loop simple. If you have to write out your own loop, you can just do it the simple way. You can keep track of the index and keep iterating until you hit the last element. When the collection you're looping over is iterable, which is the case for arrays and node lists, for example, then that's even better. You can just use for off. And this is my favorite way of looping over any kind of collection in JavaScript, because it's so simple. Now, for arrays specifically, of course, you can also use array.prototype.foreach. That also works. And the good news today is that whether you want to use for each or write your own for loop or use for off, performance-wise, it doesn't matter anymore, which means you can just make that decision and pick your favorite without performance being a factor in that decision. I think that's pretty great. Now, avoid reading, uh, avoid reading beyond the end of the array, in summary. So doing so is just as bad as hitting a hole. Now, before we move on to some more performance advice, uh, here's a fun fact. JavaScript has two zeros. There's the regular zero, which is positive, but there's also a negative zero. And although these values are strictly equal to each other, because of course, why wouldn't they be? Uh, it turns out that they're actually observably different in some cases. And object.is is an example of that. Because they behave differently, it means JavaScript engines has, have to store these values separately as well in different ways. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this has an impact on elements kinds. I mentioned earlier that a piece of advice when it comes to elements kind is to avoid transitioning to a less specific elements kind whenever you can. And this is actually harder than it seems. For example, just adding minus zero to an array of small integers is enough to transition it to packed double elements. Any future operations on this array will now be optimized in a completely different way than they would be for SMI specifically. So that's just one more reason to avoid negative zero in general, unless, of course, you need to explicitly differentiate between negative and positive zero in your code, but you probably don't. Now, the same thing goes for nan and infinity. These values are stored as a double, which means that adding a single nan to an array of SMI elements transitions it to double elements. So if you're planning on performing lots of operations on an array of integers, you should consider normalizing the values before you're adding them to the array. So normalize minus 0 to positive 0 and block nan and infinity when you're initializing the values. This way, the array sticks to the packed my elements kind. And of course, there's a one-time normalization cost involved there for all the extra checks that you do when you're initializing the array, but it can be worth the later optimizations. In fact, if you're doing lots of mathematical operations on an array of numbers, you should probably look into using typed arrays, because V8 has specific elements kinds for those as well, and they're kind of optimized for this kind of thing. In general, if you need to perform lots of operations on an array, try sticking to an elements kind that's as specific as possible, so that V8 can optimize it as much as possible. Some objects in JavaScript, especially in the DOM, look like arrays, although there aren't proper arrays. It's possible to create array-like objects yourself, which is what I'm doing here. This object has a length property, and it supports indexed element access, just like a real array. Uh, but it lacks array methods, like for each on its prototype. It's still possible to call these array methods on this object, though. Here we're calling the array for each built-in on the array-like object. And that works as expected. However, this is going to be slower than calling, array, than calling for each on a proper array, which is highly optimized in V8. So if you plan on using array built-ins on this object more than once, consider turning it into an actual array beforehand so that V8 can optimize these operations to the best of its abilities. And here, we're using slice to do that. So of course, there is a one-time cost of doing the actual slice call. But uh, this cost can be worth the later optimizations, especially if you plan on performing lots of operations on the array. And a specific example of this is the arguments object. This is an array-like object. So when you call array built-in such as for each on it, 
it works, but it won't be fully optimized the way it could be for a proper array. So nowadays, I think there is a better solution to this in the form of ES2015 REST parameters. Uh, they produce proper arrays that can be used instead of the array-like arguments object in a very elegant way. So nowadays, I think there is no good reason to use the arguments object anymore. Use REST parameters. It will make your code more elegant and more optimizable in various JavaScript engines as well. This is not a real crocodile. And it's not going to have the same performance as a real crocodile. <laughs> the same thing goes for arrays. In general, you should avoid array-like objects whenever possible and use real arrays instead. Now, after all this talk about elements kinds, you may be wondering how you can identify the elements kinds of a given array in your code base. Maybe you're debugging a performance issue, or maybe you just want to have a deeper understanding of what I'm talking about. Well, you can, run, uh, you can compile V8 from source in a debug build and run the D8 binary. D8 stands for developer shell or debug build. No one on the V8 team really knows what it stands for, actually. It's a mystery D. Uh, but what I do know is that you have to pass in the allow native syntax flag. Doing so enables access to some internal V8 functionality from within JavaScript. It's very powerful, especially if you combine this with a debug build of V8. So entering that command opens up a REPL, which is very similar to what you get if you just type node on your command line, except this way we can run some code directly in V8. So now it's time to write some code. First, we create the array that we want to test. And then we call one of those special V8 internal functions on it, in this case, debug print. And you see how the name there starts with a percentage sign? Yeah, that's not actually valid JavaScript. And the reason why we do this is because we don't want people to use this in production. It doesn't make sense to use it in production. And by making it invalid JavaScript, we kind of force it on people that they cannot use this in production. Uh, this would only work in this particular build of V8 anyway, so it doesn't make sense to try to use it elsewhere. Now, running this code prints a lot of output, even more than what is shown here in the slide. But in this case, what we're looking for is the elements kind of the array, which is listed on this line. The elements kind is holy smy elements cow. <laughs> now, that cow does not refer to the animal. It stands for copy on write, which is yet another internal optimization. But don't worry about that for now. Uh, we can talk about that in another presentation, or just come talk to me later. Let's recap what we've seen so far. We've explored what elements kinds are and how they work. And as a result, we were able to identify some practical tips that can help us boost performance. Avoid creating holes in arrays. Don't access array indexes beyond the array's length. Try to keep the elements kind of your array as specific as possible by sticking to a single value type for each array. Avoid using array-like objects. And when you have to use them, consider converting them into proper arrays before performing any expensive operations on them. Now, although this presentation covered some V8-specific internals, these tips don't just apply to V8. Other JavaScript engines can benefit from them as well. And by following this advice, I guarantee you that your code is not going to get slower in any of the other engines. In fact, it will probably get faster across the board. Now, there is one more thing that I quickly wanted to mention. Uh, we went through an example like this before, where we have an array, and it has some values in it. And if you know the values beforehand, it makes sense to hard code them into an array literal like this. But things get more interesting for larger arrays, especially if you don't know all the values beforehand. Maybe you're computing the values dynamically, or you're fetching them from some third-party source, um, or whatever. And if you know the length of this array ahead of time, especially if the array is very large, it makes sense to pass it to the array constructor like this. And doing so ensures that JavaScript engines can pre-allocate space for all the 9,001 elements the array will hold. The downside is, as we've seen before, that the array will be marked as holy from the moment it's created. So there are some ups and some downs here. When using the array constructor like this, JavaScript engines can pre-allocate the space that they need for the correct number of needed elements behind the scenes. Especially for large arrays, this might speed up the actual creation of the array. However, the array is marked as holy from the beginning, so there's potentially slower array operations on the array compared to packed arrays. It depends on which you, what you want to optimize, the creation or the operations of the array. <laughs> 
To avoid going wholly, we discussed this pattern, where you start with an empty array, and then as you get more values, you just push them to the array. Now, when you create an array, the JavaScript engine creates a buffer in the backing store to hold all these array elements. And for an empty array, that we already initialize a buffer of 16 elements in V8 to give it some room to grow. Now, when a new element is added that doesn't fit in the buffer anymore, we have to create a new buffer in the backing store and then copy over all the elements from the old array behind the scenes. And this is an expensive operation. And this is called reallocation. Now, if you start off with an empty array, for example, and then you push 9,001 items to it one by one, then V8 will reallocate the buffer in the backing store for a total of 16 times, which is not too bad, but this number grows as the array gets larger. So especially for large arrays, you might want to consider this. Starting from an empty array and continuously pushing to it ensures we never create any holes, which is good. The array remains packed, and uh, any future operations on the array can be fully optimized. But the downside of continuously pushing to an array that is uh, continuously pushing to an array is that behind the scenes, engines need to reallocate the space as the array grows all the time. And for large arrays, uh, maybe not 9,001 elements, but maybe millions of elements, uh, this might slow down the actual creation of the array. So either you choose to optimize the array creation itself by using new array, passing in the length, if you know it, so that it can be preallocated behind the scenes, or you choose to optimize the later operations on the array. In this case, it makes sense to avoid wholly elements kinds. And it's a trade-off for sure, and which of these two you pick depends on the use case that you have in your specific code. Finally, the last piece of advice I'd like to give is to write modern, idiomatic JavaScript without worrying about performance too much, because that way, JavaScript engines can make it fast for you. Thank you.